are frankly speaking about cancer, lung cancer biomarkers, and targeted therapies. My name is Ria Suarez with the Cancer Support Community. This webinar is hosted by the Cancer Support Community in partnership with Bonnie J. Adario, Lung Cancer Foundation, Free to Breathe, Lung Cancer Alliance, and Longevity Foundation. And it's sponsored by Bayringer Engelman and the Eli Lilly and Company. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. So today's call is being recorded and will be available on our website at cancersupportcommunity.org slash webinars. Our presenters will be featured first, and then we will move into the Q&A section. If you'd like to ask questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to type them in the box that's titled Q&A to the right of your screen. You can submit a question throughout the box um, throughout the event. So I'd like to start by giving some background on the cancer support community. Our mission is to ensure that all people impacted by cancer are empowered by knowledge, strengthened by action, and sustained by community. We are a global network of nonprofit organizations that provide the highest quality emotional and social support through our network of more than 50 affiliates 100 satellite locations, and our online program. These are just a couple of the programs that we offer. So we have our Cancer Experience Registry, our Open to Options program, our Frankly Speaking About Cancer Education Series, and our Cancer Support Helpline. If you have any questions about any one of these programs or would like to learn more, please feel free to visit our website or call our helpline, which is listed there at 888-793-9355. So for today's discussion, we'll be going over lung cancer, identifying signs and symptoms, diagnosing lung cancer, treatment options, learning about clinical trials, managing side effects, and then we'll move into the social and emotional concerns that come with a lung cancer diagnosis, and then finish off with our Q&A session. It's now my pleasure to introduce our featured speakers, Dr. Corey Langer and Rebecca Fritz. Dr. Corey Langer is board certified in internal medicine and hematology oncology. He is Professor of Medicine in the Hematology Oncology Division at the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine in Philadelphia, where he serves as Director of Thoracic Oncology in the Abramson, in the Abramson Cancer Center. Dr. Langer received his medical degree from Boston University. Rebecca Fritz is the Adult Program Manager of Gilda's Club Chicago. At Gilda's Club Chicago, she is dedicated to developing programming designed to reduce stress for individuals and families affected by cancer. She participates on the Mental Health Advisory Board for the organization Erasing the Distance and keeps a small private practice. Ms. Fritz is a graduate of the MSW program at Tulane University and holds a BA from Loyola University, New Orleans. So at this time, I would like to pass the presentation over to Dr. Langer. Thank you very much. It's a deep privilege to participate in this uh, program, and I hope uh, all involved, uh, all the attendees find the uh, information, Rebecca and I, uh, in part, uh, edifying. So. Um, just as background, I think it's uh, important that uh, the participants understand the public health issues involved with lung cancer. Uh, as most are aware, it is the second most common cancer in men and women. Um, breast cancer is a bit more common in women, uh, prostate a bit more common in men, but unfortunately, uh, as we are all too aware, it remains the number one cause of death amongst cancer in both men and women, despite the fact that it's number two in incidence. Uh, 2014, over 220,000 individuals in the United States will be diagnosed with lung cancer, and uh, probably one and a half million 
worldwide. The actual incidence is no doubt much higher, but uh, many cases uh, outside the U.S., particularly in uh, second and third world countries, are totally undetected. We are making progress, and I am going to uh, show you some of the recent information and trials that are getting us there. But I think it's important before I do that to give some basic background. Uh, there are two main categories of lung cancer, non-small cell, which really represents the lion's share. Uh, 85 to 88% of all diagnoses are non-small cell. And then small cell carcinoma, uh, which is the remaining 12 to 15%. 30 to 40 years ago, uh, the incidence of small cell was a bit higher, probably closer to 20%. But the increased incidence in lung cancer in women and the change in the nature of cigarettes over the last 40 to 50 years from unfiltered to more commonly filtered cigarettes seems to have presaged the uh, change in histology with an increased incidence of non-small cell. Adenocarcinoma accounts for up to about half of all non-small cell. All kinds of lung cancer are linked to cigarettes, but this is probably the least linked. And if we look at uh, the incidence of lung cancer in non-smokers, which is about 15 to 20 percent, uh, adenocarcinoma is the vast majority, probably about 80 or 85 percent of those with non-small cell lung cancer that never smoked. And again, this is more common in women, relatively speaking, and more common in never smokers or those who quit many years ago. Squamous cell used to be 35, 40 percent. That too is dropping like small cell. It's now less than 30 percent. And again, may have to do with the change in the nature of cigarettes from unfiltered to uh, filtered cigarettes. And large cell, the third cell type, uh, constitutes probably no more than 5 to 10 percent. It's important to know the histology, the actual appearance of the cancer under the uh, microscope, because our treatment is really guided by the nature of the uh, cancer. Lung cancer is not a monolithic illness. It really requires careful histologic microscopic differentiation under the microscope to determine whether it's non-small cell or small cell, and if it's non-small cell, which specific cell type is involved. Small cell tends to grow much more rapidly and aggressively than non-small cell. It generally presents in the center of the chest and lymph nodes and in the adjacent lung. It can often be mistaken for pneumonia. In fact, a, a high percentage of those diagnosed with small cell are initially diagnosed with pneumonia, either erroneously or as a result of the uh, cancer itself. As I indicated earlier, it is predominantly diagnosed in those who smoke or had previously smoked. Fewer than 2 to 3% of those with small cell are never smokers. Signs and symptoms are shown here. Uh, symptoms usually pertain to the location of the tumor. So if the tumor is confined to the chest, individuals may present with cough or bringing up blood. The formal term for that is hemoptysis. Uh, pain in the chest, shoulder, or back, particularly if the tumor is toward the top of the lungs and invading nerves. There may be a change in the color or amount of sputum, particularly for those who uh, have had a chronic cough previously. Shortness of breath may or may not occur. Hoarseness is common. It has nothing to do with direct invasion of the vocal cords. The nerve that goes to the vocal cords, that goes to the larynx, takes this uh, rather strange route from the base of the skull through the neck and then deep into the chest, wrapping around the uh, arteries, the aorta and the pulmonary artery, and then heading back up toward the voice box. So anything in the chest that involves lymph nodes um, in the center on the left side can sometimes lead to hoarseness. We sometimes see systemic symptoms, uh, weight loss, fatigue, lassitude, or if tumors spread beyond the chest, uh, symptoms that really have to do, that center on the organ that's involved. So if the liver's involved, we may uh, note pain in the abdomen, particularly on the right side under the rib cage. Uh, if there's neurologic involvement, uh, we may see weakness on one side of the body or on occasion seizures. So again, the sites of involvement generally dictate uh, the uh, um, areas of uh, the types of symptoms that exist. 50% uh, or more who present with uh, lung cancer have no symptoms whatsoever, and really that uh, is 
probably favorable in terms of uh, long-term prognosis. Those who don't have symptoms tend to do better, as you might well expect. Diagnosing disease uh, depends on physical exam, on imaging tests, including x-rays. CAT scans are uh, just about uh, 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 ubiquitous. Just about everybody who has this diagnosis will have had a CAT scan at some point. If surgery is uh, potentially uh, an option, we will often perform a PET scan, which will help distinguish other areas of involvement and also determine whether masses that we see on CAT scan are in fact truly tumors. So we can be misled. Frequently we'll see enlarged nodes that in fact don't have any involvement or areas that seem quite small and are not particularly uh, well visualized on CAT scan that are in fact involved on PET. We usually perform an MRI of the brain uh, before uh, going ahead with any specific treatment, again, to make sure the tumor is not spread there. Up to 10 to 20 percent of those diagnosed with lung cancer will have uh, brain involvement, and about half of those have no symptoms. So it's much better to catch those areas early or earlier before symptoms occur because we have new treatments available. Bone scan has sort of fallen by the wayside. PET scan has largely replaced this, although on occasion we will do that. And then there are diagnostic tests, including bronchoscopy, where a fiber optic tube is passed through the nose into the uh, windpipe and then ultimately into the lungs. And using an ultrasound guided device, we can actually, uh, and the scope itself, we can secure biopsies that will help establish the diagnosis. Thoracentesis refers to uh, inserting a needle into the chest itself, usually into a, a liquid buildup between the lung and the chest wall. Again, we can extract fluid and um, make the diagnosis. And then needle biopsies uh, can be done under CT guidance. So a radiologist uh, uh, has been specially trained can, using the CT as a guide, insert a needle from the outside through the chest wall into a lesion. Uh, the procedure can uh, go quite quickly, 10, 15 minutes, usually without any complications, and more often than not secure enough tissue to make the diagnosis. There are multiple other ways to make the diagnosis as well, but uh, a combination of physical exam imaging, including CAT and PET and MRI, and then finally diagnostic procedures are key. Lung cancer screening is now recommended for high-risk groups using a low-dose CAT scan or a computerized tomography scan. Uh, all of those on this call have actually helped pay for the study that established this. This was a uh, uh, put forward by the U.S. Preventive uh, Services Task Force and the NCI. It was a major randomized trial in at-risk individuals. No one had the diagnosis of lung cancer, but those between the ages of 55 and 70 who had a uh, minimum of 30 pack years, so a pack per day for 30 years would be 30 pack years, or two packs a day for 15 years, 30 pack years. And they were randomly assigned to either a chest film or to low-dose spiral CT. And in this group, the group that underwent CT imaging on a yearly basis for up to three years, number one, we detected uh, many more cancers in that group, and when we detected them, they were far earlier in stage, and that in turn translated into a reduction in lung cancer mortality. If you looked at the two groups, the group that had x-ray alone or the group that had CT uh, imaging, uh, the group that had CT imaging had a lower incidence of lung cancer death. So uh, CMS, uh, Center for Medicare Services, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, virtually all thoracic oncologists now routinely screen individuals between the ages of 55 and 75, and this has now been pushed up to age 80, uh, who have a minimum 30 pack years, uh, previously smoked and quit within the last 15 years, or currently smoke. And there are ongoing efforts to model this approach for those who are younger with 30 pack years or those who are older with less than 30 pack years. So uh, stay tuned. There will be more uh, data coming forward as time moves on. The best chance of cure, as I indicated earlier, occurs when lung cancer is discovered early before symptoms manifest. So uh, the lung cancer screening process is really dedicated to this approach, and the proof has come out. It was published in the New England Journal just about two years ago, and uh, it's really changed 
our uh, diagnostic approach toward uh, lung cancer. Again, before I review some of the specific treatments, I want to review staging. It's a fairly complicated process, but I'm going to walk each of you through this. The earliest stage is 1A. By definition, this is a tumor less than 3 centimeters or less than a little bit over an inch that has not spread to any other areas. You can see normal lung around the tumor. It's not touching the, the pleura, the lining tissue of the lung. It's not invading the center of the chest. And there's no lymph node involvement. A group that's diagnosed with 1A is treated almost exclusively with surgery, with resection. And the cure rates in that group are fairly good. They're not ideal, but upwards of 75 to 85%. Stage 1B is larger. Tumors between the size of 3 and 5 centimeters or have spread to uh, uh, the sac surrounding the lung, in other words, direct uh, invasion of the pleura. Uh, again, surgery is the mainstay of treatment in this group. Stage 2A is uh, up to 5 centimeters with spread to lymph nodes on the same side of the chest, or larger than 5 centimeters but less than 7 centimeters with no involvement of adjacent lymph nodes. Again, surgery is the mainstay of treatment here. Although, unfortunately, because of the tumor size of the potential lymph node involvement, prognosis can be a little bit uh, less than we see in 1A or 1B. Stage 2B, again, is uh, greater than 5, less than 7 centimeters with spread to nearby lymph nodes, or larger than 7 centimeters uh, with no lymph node involvement, or spread to the main stem bronchus. The windpipe splits into uh, two halves, the right and left main stem bronchus, if the tumor makes it to the main stem bronchus, it would be 2B. Again, as with uh, stage 1A and 1B, and stage 2A, surgery is the mainstay of treatment. Although those with lymph node involvement and those with tumors larger than 4 centimeters will generally be offered additional treatment, usually in the form of chemotherapy, for about three months after surgery. And this has been shown to improve the odds to improve survival rate. 3A disease uh, spread on the same side of the chest to nearby lymph nodes, usually within the center of the chest, or into the uh, area between the lungs. And again, this is still a curative situation. Uh, surgery up front is usually not carried out, but we have uh, data over the last 20, 25 years that shows a judicious combination of chemotherapy and radiation together, preferably simultaneously, can result in cure. 3B is a bit more advanced, spread to the area between the lungs, uh, to the heart or trachea, esophagus, backbone, or windpipe, or separate tumors in different areas of the same lung, or spread uh, to lymph nodes uh, in the area just above the collarbone or clavicle, or to lymph nodes on the opposite side of the uh, lung, uh, what we call the mediastinum. Again, even with this degree of spread, chemotherapy and radiation together are our main approach and uh, still potentially curative. Finally, stage four is spread to either both lungs or outside the chest uh, to uh, specific organs. And for some reason, lung cancer has a propensity to go to the brain or liver, or adrenals, or bone, uh, as opposed to gut or heart. Uh, Cancer can also be found in fluids surrounding the lungs and heart, what we call the pleural and pericardial uh, sacs. Uh, by definition, this is uh, spread beyond the realm of surgery, beyond the realm of chemoradiation. But here, too, we've made tremendous headway, particularly over the last 10 to 15 years, improving both the quality and quantity of uh, survival. Small cell is a bit simpler. It's broken down into limited stage disease where it's confined to one lung and potentially the lymph nodes uh, adjacent to that tumor, or extensive disease where it's spread outside the lung to the surrounding areas or other areas of the body. Limited stage small cell, again, is uh, curable with a judicious combination of chemotherapy and radiation, and that paradigm has existed for the last 20 years. Extensive stage disease is generally treated with chemotherapy alone or with uh, spot radiation to specific sites if they're causing symptoms. I'd like to review treatment options at this point. 
Your doctor may recommend any one of the following approaches depending on the stage of your lung cancer. As I indicated previously, surgery for earlier stage chemotherapy frequently in the adjuvant period, that is immediately after surgical removal, uh, if we deem uh, the individual at higher risk for recurrence. Chemotherapy can also be given in a more advanced disease or in conjunction with radiation in locally advanced disease. Radiation can be given both definitively and palliatively. Definitive means that it's uh, being given for a cure, usually over a six, seven, or eight-week period daily, uh, minus weekends and holidays, uh, and generally in conjunction with chemotherapy. can also be given over a much shorter course, uh, sometimes over just a few uh, days, uh, either for really early-stage lesions or for uh, palliative purposes to reduce uh, symptoms. Finally, targeted therapy is our newest modality. And this generally refers to agents that are uh, working on molecular abnormalities on the tumor surface or the blood vessels that supply tumors. And uh, none of these uh, modalities existed before the year 2000. We've seen literally an explosion of uh, new agents in this category. And these two have been shown to improve both the quality and uh, longevity of survival. As indicated in the second bullet, the majority of folks who are diagnosed with lung cancer, not all, but certainly more than 50%, will usually be treated with a combination of therapies, and we have certainly seen some headway. If the cancer is not spread to other tissues, your doctor may recommend surgery to remove the tumor as the first option. That would be the preferable approach, assuming you're fit enough to undergo surgery. There are three basic types of surgery, a wedge or segmental resection, which is limited removal of a small part of the lung, the standard approach, which is lobectomy, which is removal of an entire section or lobe of the lung, but sparing the adjacent lobes and the opposite lung, and then finally pneumonectomy, which is removal of the entire lung. We tend not to do the latter if we can avoid it. Um, it is reserved for larger, more central tumors, which are impossible to get to by either segment or lobectomy. Our preferred approach, when it's feasible, is a lobectomy, and uh, 80 to 90 percent of those individuals who undergo lung cancer surgery in the United States generally undergo lobectomy. Chemotherapy is the use of drugs to destroy cancer cells, and because they're given systemically, generally through uh, intravenous, they can go anywhere in the body and can chase cancer cells anywhere they exist in the body. Chemo tends to be most effective against rapidly dividing cells like cancer, but unfortunately, healthy, normal cells can also be damaged by chemotherapy, although it should be noted that the nature of chemotherapy has changed over the last 20 years. And We've been able to do a better job controlling the side effects and, in turn, improving the efficacy of chemotherapy. There are many different types of chemotherapies that have been approved for the use of non-small cell and small cell, and each individual really has different agents at their, uh, at, uh, their disposal. So treatments that are used in small cell frequently are not used in non-small cell. This is just a list of some of the agents. Uh, 25, 30 years ago, we had pitched debates whether it was worth treating advanced lung cancer because at that time, our treatments truly were fairly toxic and their uh, effectiveness was quite limited. Over the last uh, 20, 25 years, certainly since 1990, it has become standard practice, at least in those who are fit, to go ahead with uh, systemic treatment. I'd say the uh, modern era of chemotherapy was ushered in by the second agent on the list, carboplatin. Uh, which was a much safer version of cisplatin uh, with uh, less toxicity and therefore more applicable to a much larger uh, cohort of uh, individuals diagnosed with lung cancer. In the 90s, we saw the advent of docetaxel, gemcitabine, paclitaxel, and venorobine. Again, each of these agents helped revolutionize our approach toward lung cancer. And since the new millennia, we've seen the advent of newer agents, a nanoparticle albumin-bound paclitaxel, which really capitalizes on newer technology to uh, bundle the taxane and make it more effective and also help reduce toxicities. 
and pemetrexid, which was a uh, logically designed drug uh, to attack specific pathways that exist in lung cancer cells, and has become one of our standard agents in advanced adenocarcinoma. For small cell, uh, our agents are a bit different. Again, carboplatin and cisplatin are uh, typically featured, often in combination with the toposide. And then in the second or third line setting, if uh, those treatments are not working with either arena TCAN or topo TCAN, and there are a number of uh, newer experimental agents that are being looked at. Radiation is the use of high energy uh, rays, X rays, to kill cancer cells. Radiation works by damaging the genetic material in cells, and after radiation treatment ends, cancer cells will often keep dying for days or even months. So we have seen folks who've undergone radiation where we see shrinkage in a month or two, and then three months later, four months later, six months later, we see further shrinkage. So even though the radiation is quote unquote out of your system, its effects are still ongoing. And uh, Although we usually see some sort of residual uh, fullness or mass, what I often call schmutz on the films, um, uh, th that area may be totally sterilized by radiation or combinations of radiation and chemotherapy. For some people with cancer, radiation is the only treatment needed. For others, uh, it can be given before, during, or after chemotherapy or targeted therapy or even uh, surgery. Photon therapy is our standard approach. Uh, the dose of radiation is pretty level throughout, going through the skin to the level of the tumor and then exiting from the body. But there are newer forms of radiation, including proton beam, where the dose can be carefully calibrated, reduced as it gets into the body, and then stepped up at the level of the tumor, maintained at a, a higher level uh, through the course of the tumor, and then abruptly dropping off in an attempt to limit the collateral damage to normal organs that are adjacent to the tumor. There's also stereotactic radiation, including gamma knife or cyber knife, a variety of approaches where we will use multiple converging beams of uh, radiation from different angles, all centering on the same area of tumor. So you can sort of concentrate the dose that way. For lesions in the brain, we can do this in uh, one session. For lesions in the lung, generally in three to five sessions. I'd like to review biomarkers because uh, these have really helped uh, change our approach toward uh, lung cancer. Tumor biomarkers are substances produced by the tumor cells or by other tissues in the body in response to cancer. Biomarker tests look at the cells of tissue, blood, or other fluid samples to find specific genetic abnormalities or proteins that have been known to cause cancer. And biomarker testing can provide information about the cancer that will, in turn, help us determine if a targeted agent is the appropriate treatment option. And really, the advent of biomarkers since just 2004 has changed our general approach toward lung cancer, particularly non-small cell and uh, adenocarcinoma. Your doctor may test your cancer for a number of different biomarkers. The most common include EGFR, epidermal growth factor receptor, ALK, or anaplastic lymphoma kinase gene rearrangement, ROS1, another form of gene rearrangement, and then finally, KRAS, which stands for Kirsten Rat Sarcoma Virus Gene Mutation. All of these are either actionable with FDA-approved agents or undergoing research with newer agents that may potentially improve outcome. EGFR are proteins on the surface of cells that promote the growth of cancer cells and cause lung cancers to grow. As you might guess from the name, epidermal growth factor receptor, these receptors also exist on the skin, and that's key to some of the side effects that occur when we use agents that target this receptor. Uh, these receptors are also found in the gut. ALK is a gene that makes protein involved in cell growth, uh, uh, and if translocated, it's not mutated, it's not altered, but it's relocated from one chromosome to another. When that occurs, it can promote growth of cancer cells. ROS1 is very similar. There's an abnormal fusion of uh, genes uh, together uh, that activates cellular activity and leading, uh, leads in turn to tumor growth. And finally, KRAS is a protein involved primarily in regulating cell division and when mutated, 
it has the potential to cause normal cells uh, to become cancerous and for cancerous cells to grow. Of these four, the first three, EGFR, ALK, and ROS1, all have agents that are FDA approved that can target these approaches. And as I indicated previously, uh, abnormalities of KRAS are undergoing ongoing uh, uh, clinical research, which really leads us to targeted therapy. Conventional treatment, chemotherapy or radiation, destroy rapidly dividing cells in the body, whether they're normal or cancerous, so they're a bit more indiscriminate. Targeted therapies, however, locate specific mutations or other molecular aberrations in the cancer cells and in turn can then destroy cancer cells selectively, generally, though not always, sparing healthy cells. Targeted cancer therapies work by interfering with specific molecules or molecular targets that are involved in tumor growth and progression. And as a result, these drugs can block the growth and spread of cancer. So targeted therapies often work together with chemotherapy. They are being looked at experimentally with radiation, or they can be given with other toxic uh, or chemotoxic agents to deliver treatment directly to cancer cells. And we've given you a list of some of the existing targeted agents, including erlotinib, crisotinib, afatinib, seritinib, and bevacizumab, each of which has only been approved in the last 10 to 12 years. Doctors will use different types of targeted therapy in lung cancer. One is called monoclonal antibodies, and these uh, target and destroy a specific characteristic or process uh, within the cancer uh, pathway. Probably the best example is bevacizumab, which is an antibody given intravenously, usually every three weeks in conjunction with chemo, which can cut off the blood vessel supply to the tumor. In squamous cell, this drug unfortunately caused some safety issues, including bleeding. But an adenocarcinoma in combination with chemotherapy, it led to a clear-cut survival improvement in advanced uh, non-small cell lung cancer and has become really part of our therapeutic portfolio. Again, all of this research dates since the new millennia. I alluded earlier to biomarker tests. EGFR mutations are the target of erlotinib, uh, which has been approved in the U.S. for about 10 years, and then more recently, afatinib, which was approved just two or three years ago. And in those individuals whose tumors harbor the EGFR mutation, these approaches have been proven better, better than chemotherapy up front, with much higher response rates or shrinkage rates, and much better prolonged uh, or uh, progression-free survival, in other words, delaying the growth of the cancer. ALK gene rearrangements are the prefer uh, preferable targets of crisotinib, which was approved again only about three or four years ago, and seritinib, which has only been approved in the last uh, year. Crisotinib is used up front in those who have ALK gene arrangements, and like erlotinib and EGFR mutation, it's been proven better than chemotherapy, either in the first or second line setting. And seritinib is remarkable in that it actually works on individuals whose tumors have uh, shrunk and then grown on crisotinib. So we actually have a second-line oral agent uh, before we have to resort to chemotherapy. And there are a number of other agents in the same category, uh, like seritinib, that are being developed. ROS1 is the target of crisotinib, like the ALK gene rearrangements. And we see very similar rates of activity with response rates of about 55 to 65 percent that are often quite durable. Finally, KRAS is more negative predictor at this point, although we are hopeful that new agents will emerge. Erlotinib, at least, is unlikely to be terribly helpful uh, in individuals with KRAS mutations. And chemotherapy or chemotherapy in combination with new agents, including MEK inhibitors, are really the preferred approach. And this is really a very important area of research because a quarter or more of patients with non-small cell lung cancer will have KRAS mutations. As I indicated previously, EGFR targeted drugs have been approved by the US FDA, uh, erlotinib or tarsiva as it's known commercially, afatinib or gilotrif as it's known uh, commercially. And both have proven superior to chemotherapy. ALK targeted drugs have been approved by the FDA include chrysotinib, known commercially as salcori, or seritinib, known commercially as cycadia. This is an example of a patient who was treated with an EGFR inhibitor. The film on the left was uh, from February 6, 2002. 
And if you look carefully, you can see the uh, lungs, the heart's in the middle. Uh, you can see the shoulders uh, in the center of the uh, vertebra. And you see sort of this patchy, cottony pattern in both sides of the lungs, uh, which is actually indicative of the tumor. A week later, in the panel on the right, you see most of that disappearing. So this patient, in retrospect, was proven to have an EGFR mutation that's done quite well uh, with an oral agent. We see similar responses to crisotinib in those with ALK rearrangements on the left is a CAT scan. Multiple nodules existing in the lungs, looks like little cotton balls um, in both lungs. And then on the right, most of these have uh, disappeared within about three months what we call a partial remission. You still see some faint abnormalities, but beyond the, uh, the round nodular infiltrates, you're actually now seeing blood vessels that are no longer being crowded out by the tumor. It's key that you know about clinical trials. Uh, clinical trials offer people the opportunity to benefit from new treatment or new combinations of therapies, while also advancing research about the disease and advancing our treatment options. So it's a win-win, by and large. A, we get new data, uh, we potentially find out new agents or new combinations that will improve outcome. And for the most part, uh, virtually everyone on a clinical trial does as well or better than those who are getting conventional treatment. Each trial has very specific guidelines and eligibility criteria, including age, exclusions based on prior treatment, and stage of disease. So it's important to talk to your doctor or nurse about clinical trial participation. People enrolled in clinical trials receive state-of-the-art care and, as I indicated, often have access to new medicines that would otherwise be unavailable. There are several treatments currently in clinical trials for advanced lung cancer, testing new combinations of chemo and targeted agents, as well as our new therapeutic approach, immunotherapy, uh, which in the last two or three years is really making quite a difference in about one in five, one in six individuals with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Your doctor or nurse may be able to tell you about specific uh, clinical trials that might be available to you, and certainly cancer organizations that we'll review at the end of this webcast have a list of uh, clinical trials that uh, uh, are appropriate for individuals diagnosed with lung cancer. You can visit www.emergingmed.com or call 1-877-601-8601 for more information, both on clinical trials and clinical trial options. This is my list of what patients and clinicians should know about clinical trials. All trials are carefully conducted. They mandate IRB approval, which includes clinicians, healthcare workers, as well as lay individuals, people from the clergy, uh, cancer survivors. There is intensive monitoring and very close follow-up. You cannot go on a clinical trial without informed consent. Alternative options must be discussed. You cannot be coerced, and you can drop out of that clinical trial at any point. Total accrual is limited, and there are um, folks behind the scenes, biostatisticians, that oversee the results and the analysis of the data that are generated by these trials. Any sort of toxicity, what we call adverse events, and certainly serious adverse events, are reported to the IRB. And if these adverse events are excessive, they can result in a clinical trial's early closure or major amendments to make that trial safer. All clinical trials are subject to FDA audit. Enrollees on clinical trials, as I indicated previously, do as well, if not better, than patients treated off protocol or treated empirically. And for those who are worried about costs, the costs are less than 10% more than standard care. And if it's new agents or tests that are mandated by the trial that are not part of the standard operating approach, those tests have to be paid for by the uh, clinical trial. They'll uh, not be billed to insurance. You're not a guinea pig. You can opt out of a clinical trial at well at any time without compromise to subsequent care, and this is always and must always be spelled out in the informed consent form. Your physician can also halt your participation if you are not benefiting or if superior therapies emerge or if toxicity proves intolerable. Finally, placebos are only used when observation is the standard. So if we're looking at a new treatment after surgery and chemotherapy in the adjuvant period, 
a placebo control at that point after the chemotherapy is done would be reasonable since no treatment or observation would be the standard. Or if we're um, determining whether a new agent added to standard chemotherapy is better than chemotherapy alone, then the control arm may or may not include a placebo. But for those with active cancer, placebos alone are unethical. How do we manage side effects? Well, it's important to be prepared before you begin treatment to make sure you understand what to expect. So this is really the responsibility of the doctors and nurses taking care of you to review uh, potential side effects and um, to tell you how they can be addressed uh, proactively or preemptively. Everyone reacts differently to treatment. Some folks sail through treatment, others have a lot of trouble. So being prepared helps you whether you experience problems or not. There are a number of common unifying side effects, fatigue, occasional shortness of breath. We do see infection and bleeding at times, particularly if the counts drop or anemia. Gastrointestinal uh, changes, there are some of the older drugs in particular have been uh, what we call metagenic. They tend to cause a fair amount of nausea and vomiting, but we have far better treatment available now in 2014 than we had even five or 10 years ago to control that. There can be changes in appearance. Uh, some of the drugs we use cause hair loss or change the color of the hair, and you need to be prepared for that if that is likely to occur. Rarely, but occasionally, we can see pain and discomfort from certain drugs, uh, sometimes uh, as they pass through the veins. Sometimes the agents we use to protect the bone marrow can cause uh, generalized uh, achiness, and there can be changes in sexual functioning and effects on uh, fertility. Side effects from treatment can be short-lived or and go away after treatment ends. Uh, you need to talk with your healthcare team about any side effects you experience so they can help you manage them. Do not keep it to yourselves and do not share it only with your family. It is imperative that the healthcare team knows early and often, and they are there to help. There are side effects of treatment that can be long-lived, and again, it's important to talk to your doctor to know about these side effects and what to expect and what can be done to help prevent or treat them should they occur. Just to give you an example, in individuals who've uh, had locally advanced uh, lung cancer get chemo and radiation together, uh, we will often see some trouble with uh, swallowing over time, um, very commonly due to scar tissue around the uh, esophagus, the swallowing tube. Well, there are fairly straightforward procedures that can actually dilate the esophagus and make it much easier to swallow. But again, we only know about this if uh, you bring the uh, symptoms up. So again, the healthcare team, this is not just the doctor, but nurses and their staff can help you cope and manage side effects and help improve your quality of life uh, through the course of treatment. It's important to realize that palliative care is not hospice, although the two are often conflated. Ideally, it should be provided actively and proactively at the get-go. It should be discussed at diagnosis and throughout care, and this really focuses on providing people with relief from symptoms, pain and stress of a serious illness, whatever the diagnosis. So the goal, regardless, is to improve quality of life for individuals uh, with cancer and also for their family members. And it may often be provided by a team of healthcare professionals who work jointly or in conjunction with the uh, individual's oncologist to really provide an extra layer of support. Again, it's appropriate at any age and any point. There was a major study actually from Boston, uh, from Jennifer Tamell and colleagues, that looked at the, a proactive approach, monthly meetings with the palliative care team addressing pain, depression, anxiety, specific symptoms uh, regarding nutrition or uh, other symptoms related to the cancer versus our more common reactive approach. And the proactive uh, group did far better. They lived longer, they had less anxiety, less depression, better pain control, and generally a better quality of life. So at this point, I'm gonna pass the baton uh, to Rebecca. We'll talk about uh, social and emotional concerns. Uh, I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Langer. Uh, social and emotional concerns. In terms of addressing these issues, 
a lot of people experience feeling shocked, alone, and a sense of despair when dealing with a cancer diagnosis. Not uncommon at all. Um, just recognizing some of the symptoms, including difficulty sleeping, uh, feeling sad and tearful, perhaps an increase in irritability or racing thoughts, can be some of the things you discuss with your treatment team. Oftentimes, these symptoms can coincide and be mistaken for other conditions or side effects of treatment, um, but sometimes they exist on their own and they're really uh, a symptom of a larger disorder going on. So addressing depression, addressing anxiety is something that's very important to do with your treatment team. The stigma of lung cancer is especially important for us to consider when talking about social and emotional issues. We have had um, at Gilda's Club Chicago several members come in. There's one in particular who I'm thinking of. His name is David, and he tells the story of his brother. And whenever he talks about his brother who is dealing with a lung cancer diagnosis, David always says, but he's not a smoker. For us, this just underscores that stigma that can oftentimes accompany a lung cancer diagnosis. For the individual, the person who perhaps did smoke may feel guilty and accept the blame of society and of their family, um, but sometimes they haven't smoked and they are feeling that stigma as well. Family members might also blame the person um, with a history of smoking. They're, they might be upset, distraught, that you know maybe they've asked this person to quit before and now they're dealing with a, a lung cancer diagnosis. So there's blame there as well. And society in general, um, as with David's brother, society sees lung cancer oftentimes as a disease of people who smoke. And that's not always the case. So it's very important for us to identify that blame isn't helpful in these cases, uh, to challenge that stigma and to move on with treatment. Moving on with treatment also uh, is important in terms of ways to cope. Um, I mentioned David's brother here, and again, another way to cope and to deal with treatment is to perhaps, if one was a smoker or is a smoker, um, perhaps look at some smoking cessation classes. This is oftentimes offered for free at various hospitals for anyone, uh, especially anyone with a cancer diagnosis, and to really try and tackle that problem. Other organizations that can provide lots of information and support include the American Lung Association, the Bonnie G. Adario Lung Cancer Foundation, Cancer Support Community, Free to Breathe, and Longevity Foundation. Along with the information provided at the websites I mentioned, other ways to cope would be to find a support group, uh, talk to trusted friends and family, use those online resources we've just mentioned, perhaps consider counseling, journaling, or mind-body programs. Oftentimes we have people come to the clubhouse and say, you know, I'm not so sure about a group. I don't know if I want to talk to a room full of strangers and share my intimate feelings. They do come. They do connect and then walk out of that group feeling really great and actually surprising themselves um, with the connections that they've made and with the relief that provides. Through mind-body programs for stress relief, through journaling, through the arts, these provide great creative outlets. Um, each year we have a Gilda's Gallery at the club where artwork from members of the club is featured. And there's one piece that comes to mind done by someone named Stephanie. It's a picture of a, an eye with a tear. And you know, on the surface, it's a picture of an eye with a tear. Not a big deal. But when we asked Stephanie a little bit more about it, she had something very important to say. She said that you know, she calls this piece, Sometimes I Cry. And it's what I want to express to people when they tell me how brave I am and how courageous I appear to be while I battle cancer. So for Stephanie, her way to cope um, is by expressing herself through art, because otherwise she feels she needs to keep up a brave front around uh, other people in the family and her friends. So it's her outlet. Again, 
talking with your healthcare team is exceptionally important. You know, asking your doctor about the goal of your plan, how it how it will affect the quality of life. Um, oftentimes, people are surprised to learn that they can influence their chemotherapy schedule. And so, if you meet to play, you know, your bunco game every Wednesday, and your chemo is on Tuesday, and you're feeling miserable after chemo, especially the next day, it's going to interfere with that social support that you have uh, set up for yourself each week. Sometimes, just talking it over with your treatment team might present some options. You know, hey, we can change your chemo schedule to. Thursday. That way you're feeling really great on Wednesday. You can go catch up with your friends and then get your treatment on Thursday. So these types of options are out there and they're really pretty easy to do oftentimes. So it's about being honest and open with your healthcare team, letting them know what's important in your life, and also mentioning, you know, those side effects so they can help you to manage your disease. This results in a patient being empowered, being very active, really taking charge and, and being a part of your own team. In terms of relationships and community, cancer doesn't just affect the person who's dealing with the diagnosis, but everyone around them, um, loved ones, family members. Sometimes they're not quite sure what to do or how exactly to be supportive. So there's support available for them as well. Um, sometimes that's information online at the websites we mentioned. Other times it's their own support group at different cancer support communities. So it's really up to them. Um, but it's just a reminder that it impacts the whole family. We have a, a saying around here at Gilda's Club, it's for the whole family the whole time. Sometimes those relationships change over time with family, children, and friends. Friends who maybe you thought were really supportive might handle you know, dealing with illness a little bit differently than you expected or than they expected. So sometimes friends who may have seen not so important in the beginning might really come up, step up to the plate, um, offer help and support in ways that weren't previously anticipated. Maybe, for example, you know, as a, a mom with a minivan, your role in the family was to bring everybody to practices and classes and take care of everyone else. But perhaps now, uh, during treatment, it's time for folks to help out and help take care of you. So that can definitely be a change and something to adjust to. The important thing is to keep communication open. So just to talk about those challenges. Uh, support intimacy with your loved ones and your family members. As we mentioned before, it can feel very lonely and very isolating. So just really extend over that, that gap and really have support communication with your loved ones. Keep that intimacy going. And emotional health. Sensing uh, senses of hope can change over time, especially when it's appointment to appointment. Um, hope to hope, and things are changing. Maybe it was a good appointment. Maybe it wasn't your best appointment ever. So just keep in mind, it's a really long game, um, and it's important to really take care of yourself during that process. How do we do that? Well, we can do that by making sure that our level of physical activity is where we can, as high as we can have it, walking on a regular basis, um, talking with our treatment team, finding out what level of physical activity would be appropriate, keeping a healthy diet, making sure those relationships are intact, and keeping our emotional health, you know, keeping that communication open with our family members. That improves our quality of life overall. And then finding productive ways to express emotions, positive and negative helps. So I had mentioned uh, Stephanie and her artwork. That was definitely a way that Stephanie found um, to express her negative emotions. And some people aren't talkers. Maybe they're not used to sharing their emotions on a regular basis. But there are definitely ways to do that, um, whether it's through art or whether it's through just taking that chance and making an effort to have that conversation with a particular person who you want to speak with. And there's always a way to find meaning and quality in each day. 
for our members here at Gildas, we have a membership process where folks identify you know, what's changed in their lives since being diagnosed with a particular cancer, or for family members or friends, what's changed in their lives. And you know, very, very often, people say they've had a priority shift, going from you know, always on the run, always busy, always doing a lot, um, never stopping to smell the roses, so to speak, to being really grateful for small kindnesses and spending time with loved ones. So finding a way to find meaning and quality in each day is exceptionally important for people and very possible. Some resources we have here that we use often, the American Lung Association, Cancer and Careers, Cancer Support Community, Free to Breathe, Lung Cancer Alliance, Longevity Foundation, and the Patient Advocate Foundation all have great support, great resources. I particularly point out cancer and careers uh, for folks who are now working through cancer more and more on a regular basis. This website has lots of wonderful tips, um, lots of considerations, information about FMLA, and so forth. So that one is more and more, I think, important for people to understand every day. So I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Rhea for questions and answers. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Dr. Langer. Um, so I'm now going to turn it to the audience. I see a couple of you have submitted questions through the Q&A box, so I'll give it just a couple more minutes for anyone who would like to submit any questions, and I will ask and direct them to our speakers. Um, so, Dr. Langer, do you want to elaborate on your answer to the question, are all patients with stage 4 lung cancer routinely tested for EGFR, ALK, ROS1, and KRAS? Uh, absolutely. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, in um, those with the advanced tumors, uh, because we now have the new medicines that I uh, mentioned, there are a lot of them in a fat enough for EGFR. Uh, chrysotinib and serotonin for uh, ALK, uh, chrysotinib for ROS1. Uh, these are you, these abnormalities are usually, they're not always found on adenocarcinoma. So certainly anybody who's been diagnosed with adenocarcinoma, particularly if it's either recurred or um, it presents with disease beyond the chest, we'll routinely test those individuals for these abnormalities. It becomes a logistical challenge on occasion because we do need more tissue than a simple fine needle aspirate. So sometimes a core biopsy or going back to the original surgical specimen, um, sometimes a repeat biopsy is necessary. The other issue that um, comes up, uh, we sometimes see these abnormalities in uh, those with non-adenocarcinoma but who've never smoked. So. Uh, pretty much anyone who's never smoked or was perhaps a remote former smoker, even if they have squamous or large cell, will test those individuals as well. And I do foresee the day, hopefully, when uh, virtually everyone with advanced cancer will undergo testing because I think as we sort of crack the genetic code of lung cancer, we'll discover more and more uh, actionable pathways, and that in turn will lead to an, an expansion of our therapeutic uh, portfolio or therapeutic armamentarium. It's still a bit controversial to do this in earlier stage disease, but there are trials, uh, the Alchemist trial in uh, individuals who have undergone surgery and the Alliance trial in those who are getting chemoradiation where treatment assignment uh, is uh, based in part on the presence or absence of uh, molecular abnormalities. So at least in the context of a clinical trial now, uh, that is administered through the cooperative groups and through the, F uh, the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, there is a growing role for testing um, in earlier stage disease, uh, stage one, two, and three. So uh, this is a uh, rapidly emerging, rapidly changing area of uh, both clinical research and clinical practice. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so are targeted therapies used for squamous cell lung cancer as well? So um, here uh, we've not quite gotten to that point. There is a uh, clinical trial, uh, again, available anywhere through the country um, through the National Cancer Treatment Network uh, 
joining cooperative groups as well as uh, community institutions. And those who uh, receive standard first-line chemo combinations, usually with platinum, but whose uh, tumors have started to grow again or didn't respond, there is now an ongoing trial where tissue will be collected and will be typed for um, some new abnormalities that have only just been recently discovered. And then individuals who are in this category of have squamous cell and have, uh, whose tumors have gotten uh, worse despite frontline chemotherapy will then be assigned to a specific arm of this trial based on the molecular abnormality discovered. Um, each of the arms of the trial has a control arm, which is chemo alone. But there's a 50% uh, chance you'd get chemo alone or 50% chance you would get a specific targeted agent based on the new molecular abnormality. So it's, it's really cutting-edge research. Uh, the, uh, those who participate in this trial um, will have their tissue banked. It could potentially be explored for other newer markers should they emerge. And uh, uh, those uh, who actually enroll on the trial and get treatment through the trial will be getting standard treatment at a minimum or standard treatment versus uh, uh, a newer targeted agent. So uh, this trial was just approved this past year. It's just getting rolling. I think about 50 or 60 individuals have now been in, actually uh, assigned treatment, but the goal is to enroll well over 1,000 individuals. <coughs> Great. Um, so we have a question here. I'm, I'm not sure if you answered it already, but we were told that since my mom has squamous cell lung cancer, she would not be tested. What do we do now? What do you suggest? Well, there's still um, therapeutic options. Uh, our standard approach for somebody with advanced squamous is still chemotherapy. The treatment has gotten better. Uh, I mentioned one of the drugs, nabpaclitaxel, seems to have preferential response in uh, squamous uh, histology, uh, usually in combination with carboplatin. If uh, that individual is over 70, there may actually be a survival advantage, at least based on the preliminary report. So that is... Uh, emerged over the last year or two years as one of our go-to regimens in those who have squamous cell, particularly if they're older. Um, there is ongoing research looking at uh, antibodies that target EGFR, not the mutation, but just EGFR in general, when added to chemo that may improve outcome compared to chemotherapy alone. So there's certainly options. If this is the second or third line setting where tre the initial treatments uh, worked and then failed or did not work to begin with, there are still agents available, including the drug gemcitabine, venorobine, and there's a number of uh, new cutting-edge trials looking at immunotherapy, what we call the checkpoint inhibitors, basically making the native immune system work better and do a better job of recognizing tumor cells as the foreign agents they really are and concentrating the immune attack on those tumor cells. And uh, some of the participants in this call may have heard of some of these agents, uh, nivolumab, which is made by BMS, pembrolizumab from Merck Pharmaceuticals, all of these are being investigated actually in multiple venues, um, not just squamous cell, but adenocarcinoma as well, but the activity seems to be um, equal in, or maybe even a little bit better in squamous cell or those who've smoked in the past. Great, thank you. Um, Rebecca, our next question is for you. Um, how should I approach speaking with my children about my lung cancer diagnosis? Sure. There, it's very important to be open and honest with children and explain what's going on to them in their age-appropriate language. Oftentimes, kids know a lot more than we give them credit for, even when we're trying to maybe talk about things behind closed doors. Somehow, they always find out knowing something, and knowing the truth is probably much better than the version that they've come up with themselves. There's lots of books available through the library as well as through the Frankly Speaking series uh, to address talking with your kids. Um, so there, there are a few resources out there, but it's always best to be honest and uh, speak to them in simple language. Great, thank you. We have another question for you, Rebecca. Um, my spouse is unwilling to openly discuss his diagnosis. How can I make them more comfortable about sharing what he's going through? So sometimes beginning a support group yourself can be a step. 
Um, speaking with other people who might be sharing similar issues can also help give you ideas about what to say to your spouse. Um, you know, just approaching a conversation, um, providing information, you know, it, doing it in a way that's uh, not really um, aggravating, so to speak. <laughs> Someone could be feeling very irritable, very shy, very reluctant to speak about these things, and, and that's okay. Uh, each person does it in their own way. So just letting them know that you're there should they ever decide to to talk um, or should they have any questions or just want to mention anything. Um, being open for them for whenever they are ready is a good way to go. And then getting some support on your own outside um, can also be helpful during that time. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Langer, my mom has none small cell lung cancer, ALK stage four. She was on crizotinib and recently on seritinib, but it stopped working. Her oncologist mentioned there's nothing else we can do. Do you know of any new targeted therapy available soon? We live in California. Oh. <laughs> um, it's important to know whether um, this individual also had chemo. Um, if not, there is clearly a role for standard chemotherapy. Uh, the drug pemetrexid in particular seems to have preferential benefit in ALK-positive uh, non-small cell. Uh, it's not clear if that's because the majority of folks with the ALK uh, have adenocarcinoma or because it has a preferential um, impact on the ALK pathway. Uh, there are uh, other trials, certainly immunotherapy trials are potentially available. There are a number of trials that are rebiopsying individuals who have um, ALK, and on occasion discovering new um, mutations that weren't present previously. Uh, Bob Dobley from the University of Colorado actually reported on this uh, recently at one of our national meetings, and uh, unexpectedly discovered a fair amount of KRAS and EGFR mutations in those who were absolutely negative for both at the time of the ALK, uh, diagnosis of uh, ALK positive or ALK translocated uh, non-small cell. So if there is tissue readily available um, that could uh, be approached by biopsy, uh, that may be a, a potential approach. It certainly, uh, at least theoretically, opens up the doors to uh, new treatments. Um, if you're, if this individual is fit enough and the primary doctor is indicating nothing's left, it's time to have a second or third opinion. And uh, if uh, these individuals live in California, there are a number of wonderful, highly skilled, reputable thoracic oncologists uh, up and down the West Coast who would be happy to see this individual. Great, thank you. So we have a question here about a printout of the webinar. So again, this webinar and its complete recording will be available on our website. Um, I will send out an email to all those who registered for the event once it is available, and I'll also send out a printout um, or an attachment of the slide deck. So that will be available to all who registered. Um, so I do not have any more questions that came through. If you have any more, please feel free to submit them. Um, I'll give it just a couple more seconds. So go ahead and submit. Okay, so that is all the questions that we have for this time. So I just want to say thank you to everyone for your enthusiasm and your questions that have made today's webinar a success. If you'd like more detailed information, you can check out our Frankly Speaking About Cancer, Lung Cancer book, which is available to order or download from our website at cancersupportcommunity.org. Um, let me just go back to the resources page here. Again, if you'd like any more information, feel free to visit any one of these resources here, or you can call our helpline at 1-888-793-9355. Again, we'd like to thank our wonderful speakers, Dr. Corey Langer and Rebecca Fritz, for contributing their time and sharing this information with us. We'd also like to thank our program partners, American Lung Association, Free to Breathe, Lung Cancer Alliance and Longevity, 
And we'd like to thank our program sponsors, Bayringer Ingelheim and Eli Lilly and Company. Please take a moment to complete our post-webinar online survey, which you will be automatically redirected to. It's a brief survey, and we greatly appreciate any feedback that you may have. Thank you so much for your participation, and enjoy the rest of your evening.